Let's worship the Lord through his word for just a few moments. Luke chapter 19 is where we find our foundational text for the series that we've been involved in now for all of the Sundays that we have met, all of the Sundays of this new year, a New Year's series. I've entitled it simply, We've Only Just Begun in 2021. Months ago, the Lord, I believe, the Lord spoke to me about 14 areas, 14 areas of our lives where that needs to be true in this new year. We've only just begun means we're going to get at it even more. We're going to make greater progress. We're going to be involved in a greater way if truly we've only just begun in 2021. I've been using an admonition from Christ, as he said in this 19th chapter of Luke, the latter part of verse 13, and for two or three Sundays we went over the background story or the context of this statement, but the statement is simply, Jesus tells each of us, his children, occupy till I come back. Stay busy in my kingdom building. Keep your focus on heaven and on serving me on earth. Be busy about my work. Occupy till I come back. And these 14 areas are areas in which we as God's children need to be occupying. Yea, we need to have only just begun in 2021, indicating that we're going to occupy even more, going to do our best to be even busier for God's kingdom and busier in our worship of him. Let's see, how many of those areas have we gotten through already? Ten, is it? We've only just begun in our proclamation of faith, in our preaching of the fundamentals, in our preserving of the foundations, in our pursuit of freedom, our practice of forgiveness, our privilege of forbearance. We've only just begun in our pledge to the family and our praying to the Father, our producing of fruit, and then finally last Sunday in our praise of fullness. Each of these subjects or these sermons have dealt with a topic, with an area of Christian life in which we need to be busily occupying till Jesus comes back. Amen? Amen. Amen. This morning we continue with our 11th, and the Lord willing, next Sunday I'm going to try to wrap this New Year's series up. I figure if I get down into July and August, I won't be able to call it a New Year's series anymore. So Lord willing, we'll try to wrap it up next Sunday. But this morning for our 11th area, our 11th occupation, as it were, we're looking beyond these first 10 and saying to ourselves and praying to the Lord that He will help us, we've only just begun in 2021 in our pleasure of fellowship. I ask you this morning, how important is true Christian fellowship to the church of Jesus Christ? How important do you think it is? How important is true Christian fellowship? Is is Christian fellowship, pastor, worthy of consuming an entire New Year's series sermon time? Is Christian fellowship worthy of being named in this list of great and important areas of God's kingdom, like faith and fundamentals and foundations and forgiveness and freedom and family? Is, is, is fellowship worthy of being mentioned in a list like that? What do you think? Does biblical Christian fellowship really matter? What do you think? Or what do you know? I believe those are good questions, and I want to look at them this morning, and I want to look at this subject for a few minutes before we go home, thinking about another area in which the Lord would call us to occupy till He comes. 
First of all, we think about the whole idea of what is Christian fellowship. What are you talking about, Pastor, when you mention that word? Well, I suppose the definition of fellowship that I have heard the most often over the years around church circles is this. Somebody says, well, Pastor, fellowship is just two fellows in the same ship. How many of you have heard that one? Quite a few of you. I've heard it many times. However, the big problem I have with that simple definition is, is the fact that over the years of being around church and in church and growing up in church and pastoring churches, uh, working with church members and church committees and church boards and, well, church slash Christian people, sadly, over the years, I have, I'm afraid, various times, I was about to say many, let's just say various times, I have seen two fellows in the same ship who were having anything but real biblical fellowship. So I'm not sure I understand the, the cuteness of that succinct little definition, but I'm not sure that it always holds true or that it goes far enough in defining this great biblical term. And yet God tells us in His Word that true biblical fellowship is vitally important. Did you know that? I'll be honest with you this morning. I'm not sure that I know of any word or any concept around Christian circles that has become any more watered down or diluted or changed from its original biblical meaning and intent than has this word fellowship. The primary Greek word, and you've probably heard it, it's fairly well known around Christian circles. The primary Greek word translated into English as fellowship in the Bible is the Greek word koinonia. I've even known of a few churches named koinonia church, koinonia Baptist, koinonia Pentecostal, whatever. I've always thought I'm not sure if I'd want to name my church that. It's almost as bad as Heath. People want to know, what's Heath? Who's, I get mail for the health church and all kinds of funny things. In case you didn't know, Heath is a little community name here that predated this church, but has sort of disappeared over the years. But koinonia is a great word. Koinonia is a tremendous biblical concept it's one we need to understand as we're thinking of occupying till Jesus comes back. We'll get back to koinonia and the meaning in a, in a moment, but the fact is, around our church and Christian circles, most of the time, most of the time, I'm afraid, when we use this term fellowship, we're talking just about getting together, visiting exchanging with one another. We may say to some other Christians, hey, let's get together tomorrow evening for some fellowship. I'm sure I've said that many times. And what occurs when we schedule that is a time of, of socializing, usually around some good food. And there may or may not be in that evening of socializing spiritual conversation or activity mixed in. We've invited our Christian friends, let's get together for some fellowship, and we eat, and we visit, and we laugh, and we exchange stories, and we're enjoying each other's presence, and I emphasize this morning, there's nothing wrong with that. As a matter of fact, there's a lot right with it. But that which we have called fellowship is probably not really biblical fellowship if we have not been fellowshipping around God, His Word, and His truth. We might advertise as a church. <clears throat> Next Friday evening, we're going to have an evening of fellowship. Matter of fact, we're going to meet in the fellowship hall. And again, we get together. We enjoy each other's company. However, we get together for fellowship, and yet often the spiritual tone, the spiritual emphasis in our gathering is not very prevalent or is not even existent at all. 
Now again, let me deliberately pause right here and very quickly say, I want to nail this point down very clearly. There is nothing wrong with some good Christian socializing. As a matter of fact, I've already said, I believe there's a lot right with it. My personal opinion is that some of our religious forebears missed it when they said, oh no, never going to have a kitchen in the church. No, 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 no. We're never going to gather together in the church buildings, in the campus of our place of worship to eat and to socialize. I, I believe our forebears may have missed it along that line because I firmly and fully believe in socializing together as God's children. I believe it is good for us. I believe we ought to do it, and I believe we should come together as God's children and enjoy one another's presence. There's no question many churches today have devolved and degenerated into nothing but a social program. And I'm sure that's what most of our forebears who would have forbidden even the beginnings of such had in mind. There's no doubt that many churches across this nation today have degenerated into nothing other than a social group and a social program. And friends, hear me this morning. That is a horrible thing. Are you with me? But I still believe it's good for God's people to get together from time to time and, for lack of a better word, socialize. But here's my point. We probably should be slow to call that socializing fellowship, or at least we shouldn't call it that without really understanding what the biblical concept of fellowship truly is, koinonia, fellowship in light of God's Word. In the Apostle John's first letter, we call it 1 John, and would you turn quickly to that chapter in your Bibles, 1 John chapter 1. In that first chapter of John's first letter, that's not the Gospel of John, rather the little, remember 1st, 2nd, 3rd John right there at the end of your New Testament, and keep your Bibles open, if you will, to chapter 1, here in this first epistle of John. For this letter uh, of John, or this book of the New Testament, is a wonderful and excellent place for us to at least begin to try to get the picture of what real koinonia, real biblical fellowship is all about. Listen to what John says in the first two verses of his first chapter in this first letter. 1 John chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. And I'd like to ask you to at least try to keep in mind these first two verses throughout the remainder of the message because they are so foundational to what we'll look at and study in a few succeeding verses as we try to gain a grasp of biblical fellowship. Listen, verses 1 and 2, John writes... <clears throat> Christ was alive when the world began, yet I have seen him with my own eyes, I've heard him with my own ears, I have touched him with my own hands, he is God's message and God's word of life. John says, I've seen Jesus, even though he was God at creation. I've seen him. I've been privileged to touch him. I've heard his voice with my own ears. And, writes John, he has been shown to us, and we're telling the truth when we say that we have seen him. I'm speaking of Christ, who is eternal life. He was with the Father and was then shown to us. I repeat, would you try to keep that introduction, those first two verses, their content, in your mind as we study this morning? John has just introduced Jesus to his readers. Now with that in mind, listen carefully to what he says as he continues in verse 3. 1 John chapter 1, verse 3. For he says, again, I say we are telling you about what we've actually seen and heard, so, so that you may have fellowship with us. John uses the plural pronoun. He's primarily talking about himself, but including all Christians. 
I'm going to back up and repeat it again. Remember in verse 1 and 2, he's introduced Jesus. He said, I had known him. I talked to him. I heard his words. Verse 3, again, I say we are telling you about what we've actually seen and heard. So, or in order that, you may have fellowship with us. Now listen, which is really the joys of fellowship with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. What a verse in God's Word. You see, God, through John, here extends to us a warm invitation to have the most profound, the most self and soul satisfying experience possible for a human being, and that is fellowship with the Almighty God. John is introducing to us that we humans now have that privilege, and it's through the cross of Christ that we do. We can fellowship with God, says John. And then, and really only then, when we've come to a point where we are fellowshipping with God, I repeat, then and only then, we are able to have true fellowship with other people who are also in fellowship with God. Do you see all that from these verses? You with me? You following? I hope so. But for us to really understand true fellowship, biblical fellowship, we probably need at least to consider two specific things real quickly. First, a definition, and second, an application of this great word and the great truth that it contains. So first, the definition. What is fellowship? Koinonia. What is it? What does it mean? Well, fellowship basically means the act of intimate communion, sharing, and participating in attitudes and activities of mutual interests and delights. Did you get that? Fellowship is the act of intimate communion, sharing, and participating in attitudes and activities of mutual interest and delight. So frankly, with this simple definition, we can obviously see that fellowship, according to its definition, can take place among many different types of people in many different types of venues. Unsaved people may have a form of fellowship at a social club, at a restaurant, at a wherever they happen to be with friends who share mutual attitudes and interests, mutual delights. Unsaved folks can have certainly a form of fellowship according to this definition. For really we see that what is initially required, what is initially required to have fellowship in light of the definition of the word is to have an interest in, a commitment to, something of mutual interest and delight. That's basically the bare bones definition of fellowship. Now let's move to the next main thought, which will be the heart of the message this morning. Having looked at the definition, now let's think of the application, and particularly the application for Christians, children of God, using and uniting over the same basic definition of this word fellowship. For you see, friends, to rightly practice biblical fellowship, biblical koinonia with other Christians, and foremost with God, we must be, let's go back to the definition, we must be communing, sharing, participating in the interests and the delights of God. If we're going to be able to have biblical koinonia, we must be interested in, focused on, mutually exchanging and rejoicing in the same things that bring joy to the heart of God. Are you with me? Amen. Matter of fact, follow along in this same first chapter of 1 John. Because we see that when we tie it into a biblical concept of koinonia, it changes the definition a bit. It changes the real criteria for biblical fellowship, doesn't it? Look at verses 6 and 7, 1 John chapter 1. Those verses or these verses make this abundantly clear that real biblical fellowship with each other is always first about fellowship with God. Always. 
verses 6 and 7, if we say we have fellowship with God while we walk in darkness, we lie. And we do not practice the truth. But, oh, I love that little conjunction of contrast here, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have, what? Fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses us from all sin. And so still working on the application here, what? What would biblical fellowship with the Lord and with other Christians look like then? You say, preacher, there's more to fellowship than just getting together over a hot dog. So what does real biblical koinonia, what does real Bible fellowship look like? How is it, how is it fleshed out? How is it fleshed out in our day-to-day -day living? You with me? There are no doubt several components and criteria that could be mentioned here, but I believe there are at least three that are essential for true Bible fellowship. The first one is prayer. Prayer. One of the most important ways we learn about God, and I've already preached a sermon in this series about prayer, but one of the most important ways we learn about God and get close to Him and, and to other Christians is, did you know this? is through praying together. The fellowship of prayer. You see, friends, prayer is a language of love. Prayer is the lifeblood of the Christian and the church. And so, and follow it through here, to be prayerless with God and, and with other Christians is to be out of fellowship in the full sense of the term with both. I say, preacher, run that and buy me again now. I repeat, because prayer is the lifeblood of the Christian and of the church, to be prayerless or to not pray with God and with other Christians is to be out of fellowship with both in the truest, most biblical sense of this term. Now, that doesn't mean you cannot be a child of God unless you regularly pray with other Christians. It doesn't mean that. But I believe what it does mean is that your prayer fellowship with the former, Almighty God, will be greatly enhanced by your prayer fellowship with the latter, your fellow Christians. Amen? Oh, yes. Do you remember how John tied both of these in together in verse 3 that we already looked at? Let me repeat it. He said, again, I say we are telling you about what we've actually seen and heard. So, so, in order that you may have fellowship with us, which is really the joys of fellowship with the Father and His Son, Jesus Christ. I contend with all my heart that biblically, you will have a much stronger bond of biblical fellowship with your fellow believers if you will spend some time and some effort praying with them than you will have in all you ever, if, if all you ever do is simply to socialize and get together. And again, I want you to know I'm in no way knocking or dissing, getting together and socializing. I think I've made that clear among children of God, among Christians. I love to be with God's people, and I believe overall God's people love to be with each other. But I believe biblically you will have a much stronger bond of Bible fellowship with your fellow believers if you'll spend some time and effort praying with them than you will have if all you ever do is simply socialize and eat and talk about the moon, the crops, and the weather. You'll have a much closer bond through the fellowship of prayer, whether it's just two of you or whether it's your family 
or whether it's in a wonderful group like we have assembled this morning, or maybe a small group, Sunday school, another Bible study, another group that gets together. I'm in favor of every one of them. And this is one of the reasons why we learn some of the deep meanings of koinonia when we call on God together. So many scriptures makes that clear, make that clear. The power of unified prayer. There's a second essential component of biblical fellowship, and that is spiritual growth in the Word, in the Bible. Another essential component of biblical fellowship is growing in the Word of God together, the Bible, God's Word. For you see, it is one thing to read God's Word and study it personally by yourself. And may I quickly add again, that, my friend, you must do if you're going to continue to grow in the grace of God. But I repeat, it is one thing to read God's Word and study it yourself personally by yourself. But please notice that for there to be real biblical Christian fellowship with your brothers and sisters in Christ, one of the most important building blocks to that end is a regular commitment to be together under the preached Word, in the Word studied, with other believers. Do you believe that this morning? I think you must. You're here. And I hope you came to fellowship around God's Word with others of like precious faith. For we are fellowshipping together around the Word right now. Do you know that? I'll be honest with you, not only does sitting down, which I've only done now for a few weeks in preaching, when we changed to this venue, it seemed a little more convenient, and you're kind of, I'll be honest with you, not only does sitting down while I preach greatly help my badly injured spinal column, but it also makes me feel a little closer to you. I don't know if anybody else feels that way or not, but that's how I felt since doing it. I know that's a tiny thing, but the big thing is we are fellowshipping together this morning as we study and hear and read and think about and allow to be poured into our souls the Word of God. That, my friends, is real koinonia. One of the great benefits, you can already see it, it's obviously before us this morning, one of the great benefits of small group or smaller group Bible studies is that that fellowship around the Word is enhanced even more. Friends, we must be people of the Word. We must be people of God's Word. Neglect it. Or remove this whole concept, and just like being prayerless, we can fall out of fellowship with both the Lord and each other. Friend, please don't ever get the idea that seems to be quite prevalent among some people and in some folks' minds. Don't ever get the idea that living the Lone Ranger type of Christianity, or in other words, not being in prayer and in the Word with other Christians, is okay when you have an opportunity to be in fellowship around the Word and prayer with other Christians. Don't get the idea that the old Lone Ranger type of serving God God is a good thing if that's only a good thing or to do that only. God has not established or sanctioned, privatized Christianity only when we have the opportunity for biblical fellowship with others of like precious faith. Hebrews 10.25 would remind us of that truth. There God says to the Hebrew writer, don't forsake, don't quit, don't give up, don't stop your assembling together like some people have. I love the way one translation puts that. It just flat out says, let us not neglect our church and worship meetings like some people do, but rather let us come together 
in fellowship, this is still scripture, Hebrews 10, 25, rather let us come together in fellowship of exhorting and encouraging one another and let's do it all the more, not less, but more as we see the day of Christ coming, approaching. Any amens out there this morning? In Acts 2.42, we are told that the brand new post-Pentecostal church, listen to what they did. <laughs> they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. That was God's word at the time, and it's still God's word today. God gave apostles, inspired men of old, inspiration to write down his word. Let me back up and repeat Acts 2.42 again. In that new church, they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, that's God's word, in fellowship, that's what we're talking about this morning, breaking of bread. See, we're allowed to eat together, aren't you relieved now? We're allowed to get together and eat and enjoy each other's presence. Matter of fact, God encourages it, breaking of bread and prayers. It's all right here in that one verse, Acts 2.42. Not only praying and studying God's Word together, but a third and the final component I want to mention of real koinonia, real Bible fellowship, is through the work of the gospel. Through the work of the gospel. Have you ever been at a church work day? Have you been, ever been on a short-term missions trip? Have you ever come in with two or three other people and just swept the floor in the sanctuary of God's house? Have you ever directed parking and traffic? Have you ever handed out a bulletin? Have you ever knocked on a neighbor's door along with another Christian in twos, as God references? You're fellowshipping around the work of God and the gospel. And it is a vital component to real biblical fellowship. Friends, we're people on a mission on this earth. Amen? That's why I reminded you a little while ago, keep your focus on God and on heaven. We're on a mission in this earth, a mission now that we're here and while we're here of advancing the gospel in partnership with the Lord, our vertical fellowship, and with one another, our horizontal fellowship for the glory of God and the gospel. All biblical fellowship with God and each other must be saturated with the gospel in our conversations and our activities if it is to be true biblical fellowship at its best in meaning. I hope we can see this this morning, understand it. We've tried to dig a little deeper into a subject that, as I stated at the outset, is usually pretty surface. And we're trying to dig a little deeper in God's Word to see what beauties, what glory, what blessing God has in store for us, not only in fellowshipping with Him, but in truly, biblically fellowshipping with one another. And I hope we see it. Oh, I hope we understand it this morning. The fact that it goes beyond a meal, as good as that meal may be. It goes beyond chit-chat about this or the other, and that's so important especially with new Christians, but with all of us humans. But it goes beyond that. For to be truly biblical, it means that together we are a praying people. We are a Bible-studying focused people, and we are a gospel-focused people with each other and with Him who calls us to true fellowship. Summing it up like this, biblical fellowship may contain a social element. As a matter of fact, it probably will, a social exchange between a couple of human beings or more. But to be truly biblical, to be truly biblical, it must be primarily spiritual. Whether you're talking about the things of God at that moment, whether you're discussing the Word of God or praying at that second, your motive, your direction, your whole foundation is to bring glory and honor to God in the truest and best Bible fellowship. Let's stand together this morning. May it truthfully be said, let me change that and say, may it biblically be said of us here at Heath Church, 
Praise God, we've only just begun in 2021. In our pleasure of fellowship. Amen. Our altar is always open. As I'm closing in prayer, if you feel a need this morning, would you slip out and come up? You're welcome to stand or kneel or sit at the front uh, seats. If you'd like to talk to the Lord before we go home today, and I realize this isn't what you'd call a strong evangelistic sermon, pleading with people to come to Christ, though it is in a sense. If you have a need, if the Spirit's spoken to you, slip on out as I'm praying. We'd love to have a closing prayer with you if you have a need this morning. Father in heaven, we thank you. Lord, I thank you for the blessings of true biblical fellowship. I love to be with my brothers and sisters in Christ. Yes, I also try week by week to be with those who don't know you, those who are not saved, maybe those who've just become saved and are, are babes in Christ, as it were. I love to be with them and let your spirit lead me in fellowshipping, and we can fellowship to a point with anyone else, no matter his spiritual status. But I also thank you for the depth of real biblical fellowship among your children. You talk about it a lot in your word, Lord, a lot more than I was able to include this morning. Fellowship in prayer, fellowship in your word, fellowship in the work of the gospel. Oh, what a blessing. And Lord, I just feel like I don't know what's coming in the days ahead for our country or our world. I don't know other than what you've told us in your word that things are going to get worse instead of better. And it will be in days such as Noah's day that you return. Lord, there are lots of areas in our world that are just that bad already and seemingly getting worse. But Lord, I believe whatever we as Christians face in the future, this subject that I've tried to preach about this morning in a rather paltry, poor way is going to become more and more and more and more important. Because when we're faced with persecution, and I have an idea, None or almost none of us has really faced that in our lives yet, for Jesus' sake. But Lord, I believe if we're ever faced with persecution, if we're ever confronted with a choice of serving Jesus or turning our backs on you at peril of our lives, I believe here, in such a situation, we would see the import of what I've tried to share this morning in a much greater way. Lord, we need to be banded and bonded together as your children in prayer, in your word, in the work of the gospel. And that does go beyond a hot dog and a Coke. We must be banded together in our hearts, first in fellowship with you, and then in real biblical fellowship with one another. Help us to so be. In Jesus' precious name, amen.